History is full of icons that represent entire eras and periods of Earth's history. Merely mentioning their name can fill your imagination with images of long-lost worlds. From gigantic dragonflies, like Meganeura, that were prevalent during the swampy, oxygen-heavy Carboniferous period some 300 million years ago, to Tyrannosaurus rex in the Cretaceous period 65 million years ago. Far more recently, though, is the woolly mammoth, thought to have first appeared around 400,000 years ago during the Pleistocene, which is perhaps better known to many as simply the Ice Age. The woolly mammoth stood over 11 feet tall at the shoulder and weighed nearly six tons. And with its shaggy, rust-colored hair, long curved tusks, tall dome-shaped head, and camel-like hump on its shoulders, it had an unmistakable appearance, and one that lends itself well to the way we often imagine the megafauna of the Ice Age. For millennia, mammoths roamed the Earth alongside other giants like Megatherium, the woolly rhinoceros, and its relative, the similarly elephant-like mastodon, and of course, fearsome predators like the dire wolf, the saber-toothed tiger, and the infamous short-faced bear. But they had another, more prolific enemy as well, man. Mammoth remains, dating some 45,000 years old, found in the Arctic, show signs of spear attacks focused around the eyes, jaws, and ribs. Kill sites in Poland and Austria from as far as 28,000 years ago provide evidence of people catching and killing mammoths in large numbers. And more recently, what are described as mammoth traps were discovered in Mexico and announced publicly in November of 2019. They are estimated to be 15,000 years old. The mammoth traps were effectively shallow pits. A mammoth or some other animal could be driven into. And once in the pit, they couldn't escape and would ultimately be killed. It's easy to see why mammoths would be so prized, possessing a thick hide covered in really thick hair, enough meat and fat to feed a village for a good long while, and plenty of large bones that could be shaped and used as tools or even building materials. Mammoths, it seems, had a close relationship with humans, one way or another. The Chauvet Cave in France has depictions of mammoths thought to be made by humans some 30,000 years ago, and the Ruffignac Cave in France features some 168 paintings of mammoths dating back to around 13,000 years ago. It's interesting, because the next closest number in the Ruffignac Cave is the buffalo, at 29. Clearly, the mammoth had an outsized presence on the human mind. Mammoths were believed to have gone extinct, along with many of the other Ice Age megafauna, at the end of the Pleistocene some 10 to 12,000 years ago, due to rapid environmental changes and increasing human pressure. But no one's really sure what caused those changes, or if there were really even enough humans to seriously affect their numbers. One theory I tend to favor is the Younger Dryas impact theory, or some iteration of it. The idea that a comet, or maybe more than one comet, caused rapid melting of the glaciers, which led to global flooding on a scale perhaps never seen before or since, and subsequent environmental changes that many animals, and perhaps even people, could not recover from. But notice I said, were believed to have gone extinct. Mammoth remains, discovered on the Alaskan island of St. Paul, show mammoths surviving to around 5600 BC, some 4,000 years after they were thought to have disappeared from the American mainland. And on Wrangell Island, off the coast of Siberia, evidence shows a small population of mammoths survived until as recently as 2000 BC. That would put the death of the last mammoth at around the same time modern Egyptologists suggest that the Old Kingdom in Egypt was building the Great Pyramids of the Giza Plateau. Whatever happened at the end of the Ice Age and the beginning of our modern period, the Holocene, must have been epic. Massive populations of mammoths and other megafauna were wiped out entirely. But somehow, a small group of mammoths got stranded on a couple remote islands. If you look at St. Paul and Wrangell Island on a map, it's obvious that they would have been connected to the mainland while sea level was much lower in the late Pleistocene part of what we now call the Beringia Land Bridge that connected North America and Asia. It's likely that the mammoths that were stranded on these islands got stuck there as the sea level rose. I'll have a map of the late Pleistocene in the post accompanying this podcast on loreandlegends.net so you can see for yourself. But were the island mammoths, 
really the last of the mammoths? So here's where we'll get into the weird stuff after a quick break. Everything covered so far in regards to the mammoth is actually recent knowledge that we take for granted. Woolly mammoth remains were not even widely presented as a separate species from African or Asian elephants until the mid to late 1700s, and no one had any real idea how bones from a warm climate elephant wound up in frigid places like Siberia. In 1796, a French naturalist named Georges Cuvier was the first to claim that the mammoth was a separate species, and one wiped out by some kind of catastrophe. But even that took some time to catch on. Curiously enough, some Native American tribes have stories about beasts that may or may not in fact have been mammoths or mastodons. One such tale about a creature called the Yakwawi may in fact be a mammoth. A beast described as being immensely useful for people for its thick hide, hair, meat, and bones, but it was incredibly hard to kill. The best weapons and the best warriors often failed to bring one down without losing some of their own. To that point, it even mentions these beasts as being from a time before, a time when the creator still walked among men. The Yakwawi was ultimately caught up in a battle with humans, and eventually even the creator himself. They were all destroyed, except perhaps one who escaped somewhere to the north. Does this sound kind of familiar? Well, if you paid attention so far, maybe it should. If we take the Yakwawi to be a mammoth, or even a mastodon, the story makes sense. A massive and formidable animal, one that could feed and supply a whole village. But think about trying to attack a bull elephant with spears. You'd have to be the ballsiest or most desperate people to have ever lived. In the Yakwawi story, we even get supernatural intervention to help in the fight against the mammoth. But now think about the mammoth traps. The traps were perhaps a deliberate result of people using our greatest weapon, our mind, to avoid combat with one or more angry six-ton mammoths. And as with the end of the Ice Age, the legend tells of the last surviving beasts escaping to the far north. But to be fair, in many other stories, the Akwawi is described as more or less a giant bear. I do wonder though, if the story was about a mammoth, and then handed down for centuries, it wouldn't be a stretch for a large, angry, hard-to-kill beast to get reinterpreted as something like a grizzly bear, long after the mammoths disappeared from memory. But what if the mammoths still existed even more recently than the four to five thousand years ago? as claimed by finds on St. Paul or Wrangell Island. Well, it turns out there is a story about just that, that perhaps also has its roots with the Native Americans. In the November 28, 1896 issue of the Portland Press, Portland, Maine, that is, an interview with Army Colonel C.F. Fowler describes a peculiar story he was told while in Alaska working for the late Alaskan Fur Company. Two years ago last summer, I left Kodiak for a trip to the headwaters of the Snake River, where our traveling agents had established a trading station at an Inuit village. The chief of this family Inuit was named Tulitima, and to him I was well recommended. He received me hospitably, and I at once began negotiations for the purchase of a big lot of fossil ivory which his tribe had stored near the village. The lot weighed several thousand pounds and was composed of the principal and inferior tusks of the mammoth, and the remains of thousands of which gigantic animals are to be found in the beds of the interior Alaskan watercourses. I subjected the ivory to rigid inspection, and upon two of the largest tusks I discovered fresh blood, traces, and the remnants of partly decomposed flesh. I questioned Tulitima, and he assured me that less than three months before, a party of his young men had encountered and drove off monsters about 50 miles above where he was then encamped, and had succeeded in killing two, an old bull and a cow. At my request, he sent for the leader of the hunting party, a young and very intelligent Indian, and I questioned him closely about his adventure among a race of animals that the specific people claim are extinct. He told a very straightforward story, and I have no reason to doubt its truth. He and his band were searching along a dry water course for ivory and had found a considerable quantity. One of the party, who was in advance, 
rushed in upon the main body one morning with the startling intelligence that at a spring of water about a mile above where they were then, he had discovered the sign of several of the big teeth. They had come to the spring to drink from a lofty plateau further inland and had evidently fed in the vicinity of the water for some time. The chief immediately called about him his warriors, and the party, under the leadership of the scout, approached the stream. They had nearly reached it when their ears were suddenly saluted by a chorus of loud, shrill, trumpet-like calls, and an enormous creature came crashing towards them through the thicket, the ground fairly trembling beneath its ponderous footfalls. With wild cries of terror and dismay, the Indians fled. All but the chief and the scout who had first discovered the trail of the monsters. They were armed with large caliber muskets and stood their ground, opening fire on the mammoth. A bullet must have penetrated the creature's brain, for it staggered forward and fell dead, and subsequently, on their way back to their campground, they overhauled and killed a cow with big teeth, which was evidently the mate of the first one killed. I asked the hunter to describe the monster, and taking a sharp stick, he drew me a picture of the pale animal in the soft clay. According to his description, it was at least 20 feet in height and 30 feet in length. In general, shape it was not unlike an elephant, but its ears were smaller, its eyes bigger, and its trunk longer and more slender. Its tusks were yellowish-white in color and six in number. Four of these tusks were placed like those of a boar, one on either side in each jaw. They were about four feet long and came to a sharp point. The other two tusks he brought away. I measured them and they were over 15 feet in length and weighed upwards of 250 pounds each. They gradually tapered to a sharp point and curved inward. The monster's body was covered with long, coarse hair of a reddish dun color." End quote. Colonel Fowler also goes on to say that Alfred P. Swineford, who was the second governor of Alaska from 1885 to 1889, had himself seen and declared that a small herd of mammoths was indeed living north of the Snake River in Alaska. Now, if you look at a map, saying north of the Snake River is actually kind of vague, and it leaves a lot of land to be explored. But if you go straight southwest of the mouth of the Snake River, you'll find St. Paul Island far out at sea, where mammoth remains were dated to as recently as 5600 BC. As far as I can tell, there is no other record of Alfred Swineford claiming to have seen them nor are there any accounts of Colonel Fowler. There is also the description of the mammoths themselves, which appears to be embellished, possibly by some excited locals, but actually still fairly accurate, except for the tusks. Fowler's account mentions four smaller pig-like tusks in the jaw of the animals. Mammoth remains we find today don't have these extra tusks. Considering that fact, the story perhaps isn't reporting a mammoth as we know them, or there was confusion about the size of the teeth, or maybe after several thousand years of inbreeding, they acquired some new trait. Or it's all made up. So what do you think of that story? Could a small group of mammoths have survived in remote parts of northern Alaska into the 1900s, evading people for millennia? If they did, northern Alaska would certainly be the best place to do it. As it turns out, though, they might not need to be hiding in the forests of Alaska or Siberia. As the permafrosts in Siberia become less permanent, some remarkably well-preserved remains of all kinds of Pleistocene animals are being exposed. From mammoths, to cave lions, to wolf pups, to horses, each new find brings with it the excitement of buried treasure, as we get as close as we may ever get to a time machine. That near time machine isn't limited to the past, either. As cool as finding well-preserved frozen remains is, it's perhaps the future that is the most exciting. Since we started digging up mammoths, we've learned all sorts of things about them, from their diet to special proteins in their blood that allow them to function in sub-zero temperatures. And there's the rush for mammoth ivory, which I go into more detail at loreandlegends.net. It's become a full-blown industry and even helped take some pressure off African and Asian elephants. But it's the idea of resurrecting the mammoth wholesale that is all the rage. If you are willing to cough up somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to 100 grand, you can already have your favorite family dog cloned. In fact, the American DEA has paid for clones of gifted dogs in the past. But the mammoth isn't quite there yet. We still apparently haven't found enough intact DNA to come up with a complete genome. So, for the moment, the idea of a completely cloned mammoth is still futuristic. But a part mammoth is absolutely on the table. 
a team of Harvard scientists, led by George Church, are working on using CRISPR, the technology used to edit genetic codes, to introduce some known mammoth traits into Asian elephants. The long-term goal is still to get very close to a full-blown woolly mammoth, but in the near term, the thinking is that some of the mammoth traits could be used to expand the range of its closest living relative, the Asian elephant, and help save them from the endangered species list, or the extinction list. Beyond this, research in Russia, at a place called Pleistocene Park, is reintroducing big herbivores to the northern tundras. The purpose here is to test the hypothesis that grazing herbivores actually end up restoring the grasslands, now aptly referred to as the Mammoth Steppe, that were present during the late Pleistocene. These grasslands were the kind of places where woolly mammoths would have lived. Herbivores like the musk ox, Yakushin horse, bison, reindeer, along with predators like wolves and bears, have been released into Pleistocene Park, and one day they would very much like to have woolly mammoths or at least woolly Asian elephants. By clearing snow as they roam and forage, and preventing trees and shrubs from taking over, these animals could actually cause the permafrost to have a stronger cooling effect in the winter, which leads to less thawing in the summer, and therefore less greenhouse gas emission in the form of methane, which the permafrost is full of. We have a long history with the woolly mammoth, dating back farther than we can remember. And regardless of the mammoths going extinct 10,000, 2,000, or maybe even just 100 years ago, they have left an indelible mark on the human mind, and we have never stopped being fascinated by them. In 2017 alone, Russia exported around 72 tons of mammoth ivory recovered from thawing permafrosts. So even in death, they have a market for the remains not that different from the market that existed during their life. It's a matter of when, if you ask me. The main question that remains is the moral one. Should we bring them back? Or should we create an unnatural elephant hybrid? What do you think of the story of the mammoth? Me? I want to know if they were aggressive, like an angry African elephant cornered by some poachers. Or were they more docile like a cow? I think that perhaps ties into how we managed to catch or kill so many of them in the past with nothing but spears, or maybe pits. And also, did a few distant offshoots survive until recently in remote regions of the far north? And of course, will we be seeing them again someday? Check out loreandlegends.net for more information on this subject and a list of links to sources related to this episode. If you like the podcast, be sure to subscribe and drop me a five-star review. That's probably the best thing you can do. You can also follow me on facebook.com slash loreandlegends, and if you feel generous, visit patreon.com slash loreandlegends or paypal.me slash loreandlegends, where a mere dollar will help support the show and unlock supporter-only bonus content for you. That's all I had for this episode. Thanks for listening. See you next time. Music in this episode, in order of occurrence. From filmmusic.io. The Complex, by Kevin McLeod. Available at incompetech.com. Licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0. From filmmusic.io. Sky of Our Ancestors by Kevin McLeod. Available at incompetech.com. Licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0. Also from filmmusic.io. Drums of the Deep by Kevin McLeod. Available at incompetech.com. Licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0. And lastly, from filmmusic.io, Jalanda by Kevin McLeod, available at incompetech.com, licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0.